Hello, I'm Professor McCoy, and today uh, we're going to talk about Plato, the ancient Athenian theater, and modern role-playing games. Uh, so, every once in a while to sort of set the context for uh, why I think this is important, why we're talking about it, uh, every once in a while there is a trend to sort of try and vilify gaming, especially in video gaming. Um, to say that video games are corrupting people, corrupting young kids, or whatever the case might be. This is the usual story. This is the narrative that we wind up being told. I would argue that that might be the case, but it's also certainly the case that uh, that video games can be uh, not only productive psychologically, but can be a tool for moral education. Uh, and I'm going to also argue that Plato, uh, the one of the best philosophers in history, would agree with me. Uh, and we will see evidence for that from public. So, first of all, this kind of criticism can come from all sorts of places. This criticism can come from, uh, can come from uh, the left or the right, politically speaking. Uh, the left tends to criticize video games for, uh, for problems of representation, problems of uh, problems having to do with sexuality, problems having to do with you know, training people to dehumanize other people, that sort of thing, right? Whereas the right will typically talk about video games promoting uh, promoting uh, sex and violence and all that sort of thing. Um, it just depends who is doing it and what and when and all of that. So this, this kind of criticism comes from everywhere. Um, it's from sociologists, it's from politicians, it's from psychologists. We have some evidence, as far as I know, again, I don't know too much about this in particular, but I'm told at least we have some evidence about the psychological effects of desensitization when it comes to violence, especially in video games. So there might be genuine problems there. However, that's not my concern. My concern is to talk about a very particular kind of relationship we find between video games and moral education. Uh, and that is uh, an understanding of how we practice ethics. Because ethics is not something we simply learn in the abstract. Uh, and I, I mean, this is a little bit of a, uh, I guess a um, uh, self-criticism, being s at least sometimes an ethics teacher myself. There's more to teaching ethics than simply getting up in the front of a classroom like this one and lecturing in front of students and teaching you know, propositions. There is a practical aspect to it. Ethics needs to be learned. All of the ancients knew this. Plato talks about this extensively, basically throughout the middle books of the Republic, especially two and three. We're gonna be looking at three especially. Uh, Aristotle talked about this. He thought that you, did, you couldn't study ethics academically until you had already grown up having learned how to be a good person. So he basically thought you couldn't learn ethics until you were uh, around 60 years old because you didn't have the, uh, the sort of well-formed habits in order to do so. So how do we learn these habits? Well, through acting. Right? We act in a good way, in a way that we're told is good, in a way that we learn from others is good. We learn to do good things, and so we do them. And we develop habits of virtue, right? However, sometimes, it's very hard to do so. Sometimes uh, doing the right thing would be impossible given our particular circumstances, right? I, as a, as a mild-mannered academic, have a hard time practicing the virtue of courage, right? Especially physical courage. I don't confront a lot of physical danger, as you might be able to tell uh, based on you know, myself and you know, other things that you may have heard from me in class or in, on my channel or what have you, right? It's not really it's not something I encounter every day, right? I am not one who goes out and faces danger on a daily basis and confronts it with the proper boldness of a virtuous man, right? Not my thing, I don't do that. However, that isn't the only way of practicing moral virtue. Uh, there is the possibility of rehearsal, mental rehearsal, going through what one would do in a circumstance and deciding in advance how one ought to behave and how one ought to act in, uh, in difficult circumstances. Now, the closer you can get mentally to an actual representation of what's going on, the more impact that will have on one's moral development, the more likely we will be to be able to do the right thing when the time comes, even if the thing is difficult. Right? All right, so you might see where I'm kind of going with this. Right? My overall argument, my thesis, is that um, video games and other, especially role-playing games, um, any kind of imaginative gaming um, can be this type of mental rehearsal. It can prepare us 
to do the right thing in circumstances that we ordinarily would not encounter. Right? We can encounter a situation in a game that we can't encounter in real life. This is the same thing that children do when they're playing. Right? Children are playing an imaginative game. Somebody is being a brave knight facing down a dragon. Kids aren't playing with dragons, but they are in their imagination. And we, as any kind of any human beings of any age, can do something similar. Okay, so how exactly, and what does this have to do with Plato, and what does this have to do with ancient Athenian theater? Okay, so for that, we do really need to get into Book Three of the Republic. Uh, in particular, this is um, this is the Republic, Book Three. Uh, beginning around 392, onward, throughout most of the rest of Book 3, um, through around around 402, I think is about when this ends. Um, I should say about 402. Uh, right around there, uh, and this is the Stephanus numbers, this is the marginal numbers in any copy of the Republic. So around here is where Plato's talk, Plato talks about what? Well, the character Socrates, uh, as a sort of mouthpiece for Plato in this instance, talks about what kinds of acting we should have in the theater of our perfect city. Now, uh, I'll be, uh, I've, I've talked elsewhere in this series, so if you haven't seen the rest of it, link it below in the description. Um, I've talked elsewhere in this series uh, about Plato's allegory uh, throughout the Republic. So if he's talking about what we ought to do in constructing the perfect city, what he's talking about here is how we ought to construct the perfectly just person. So this is, for all intents and purposes, a prescription, or sorry, um, a you know, prescription uh, for how we, anyone who's interested in cultivating moral virtue, how we ought to do so with respect to imitation, acting, theater, anything like this. All right, so he begins by making a distinction. He distinguishes between a couple of ways of telling a story. Uh, and this is around, uh, this is 392D, um, where he talks about uh, through narrative versus imitation or some combination of the two. We can tell a story in, in two or perhaps three different ways. One way is through narrative. The other is through imitation. Uh, or some combination of the two. Right? So, narrative or imitation. What do these mean? We can look, uh, we, can, we can sort of analogize this and put this in sort of modern terminology. Uh, a narrative is a strictly third person. Um, so this is where the poet Homer describes, to use Plato's example, describes what the hero Achilles did. Right? Whereas imitation is something we would call acting or first person. Acting. Acting out a role, imitating, putting oneself into a particular role. So the difference here. Uh, and of course, there are in between, where there is a narrator who describes events and imitators who act out those events. Both of these are ways of uh, ways of telling a story that Plato considers. So he talks about uh, the purely narrative acts of poetry, uh, poetry and broadly speaking storytelling. We tell stories in this way, uh, and then we also talk. He also talks about imitation. Uh, this being primarily having to do with, uh, with the genres of tragedy and comedy in the Athenian theater. It would also have, talk about things which have elements of both, and that would primarily be epic poetry and some other similar uh, forms, where there is a narrator who then will take on a role of a particular character to say something or to do something in their role. Right? Um, th this was a, uh, this, was these, this sort of tripartite way of, uh, of telling stories, these three different ways of telling stories was uh, was a novel development, uh, as far as I understand it, uh, in Athenian theater, uh, particularly its focus on imitation, 
uh, in tragedy and in comedy. Uh, and they focus on actors imitating what a character would do. Actors playing a role, so to speak. All right. So Plato asks, what is the appropriate thing for the guardians to do? And the guardians here of the city are supposed to be the, the, um, the most morally upstanding. Uh, the, those, part, those members of the city which most fully embody its justice and its wisdom. Uh, so what this is to say is that if we are to imitate, we as uh, students of moral philosophy, are to imitate any of the parts of the just city, it ought to be the guardians. Especially if we are to be wise, if we are to be philosophers, if we are to be, uh, if we are to be just people. That's again the goal of the Republic. So, what are we to do? If we're to tell stories, should we narrate, should we imitate, or should we do both, and under what circumstances? Okay. So there are a few things he points, he brings up. First, uh, is that imitation is hard. <laughs> he brings up that to imitate something, you have to know quite a bit about it, right? To imitate a sailor, one has to know how to sail. To imitate a soldier, one has to know how to fight, at least to an extent, right? Or at least how to act as if one were fighting, act as if one were sailing, act as if one were in whatever role they're in, right? This can apply to professions, like I've said, or this can apply to stations in life, the kind of person that we're talking about. Right? So you, if you're going to take on a role of a king, one has to know how to act kingly. If one is going to act like a slave, one has to know how to act slavishly. If it, one is going to act as a woman, one has to know how to act feminine. Now, this is especially important in Athenian theater because all of the actors were men. Uh, this is not particularly about women in terms of actresses, right? So this is men acting these parts. We can apply this in either way, right? Playing uh, like a role that is uh, that is uh, cross genders, or how that, however that might go, right? And in what circumstances that may or may not be appropriate. Okay. So all of this in mind, the difficulty of imitation. He brings up uh, the the problem that he's brought up earlier as well in book two which is that any given person has a particular role to play in society. A given person can be particularly good or can be best at one thing. This is their function. This is their function in society. If one person is particularly good at a great many things, they will be excellent at none of them. This is the whole idea of jack of all trades is a master of none uh, that really traces its way back to Plato. So someone who is who is decently good at imitating lots and lots of different things, especially in different modes of so tragedy and comedy, which he separates out. If somebody is particularly good at all of these things, they will not be very good at anything, even imitating a particular role. Right? So, all right. So there's problem number one. Right? First problem here is the difficulty of imitating multiple roles, of being able to play different roles, especially by a person who is not specialized in doing so. Now, he does say that there are people who are good at imitating, and these are actors. Um, but again, this is a, a sort of a quirk of uh, ancient Athenian uh, theater, which we kind of see today to an extent. But there were actors who were particularly good at drama, and there were actors, or sorry, uh, to tragedy, and there were actors who were particularly good at comedy, but there were very few, if any, who were good at both. So, because these were different techniques, different ways of acting, they have to be done by different people who have different expertise. Someone who is not an actor, uh, it is actually quite difficult to do either of them. And if you've done any kind of acting as a non-actor, you can probably attest to this. Acting is actually quite difficult. Now, Plato says this is particularly difficult, again, because one has to have some knowledge of what one is acting, of the role one is acting. And usually this has to be expertise, first-hand knowledge. This has to be one's expertise, one's role, one's function. And it isn't. Right? For guardians, their role is rulership of the city, their role is wisdom, their role is courage, their role is virtue. And acting, especially as a lower role, is not acting virtuously. It's not acting their role. This brings up the second point, which is that no one, especially guardians, should act in a way unbecoming of them. So, 
Um, we find in, uh, this is around, um, too far, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, this is around uh, 395 C and D, and in through the, uh, through moving forward. Um, he says, If they do imitate, they must imitate from childhood what is appropriate for them, namely, people who are courageous, self-controlled, pious, and free, and their actions. They mustn't be clever at doing or imitating slavish or shameful actions, lest from enjoying the imitation they come to enjoy the reality, or haven't you noticed that imitations practiced from youth become part of nature and settle into habits of gesture, voice, and thought. So, his point here is the guardians, if they are to be practicing virtue, should practice virtue even in their poetic uh, and theatrical imitations. So what this means is that someone who wishes to be virtuous should not imitate or play the role of a vicious heroine. This is going to be very important moving forward once we get back to you know, role playing and all this. Right? Because again, he's talking about in the context of theater, but we are going to extract some of what he has to say and place it into our context. All right, so virtuous people, people who strive to be virtuous, should imitate virtue. They should not imitate vice. All right. This is a major principle, so let's actually look at this. Virtuous people should imitate virtue. Virtuous people should imitate virtue, they should not imitate vice, they shouldn't pursue, uh, they shouldn't try to take on the role of something which is beneath them. All right, they should, by contrast, imitate those things which are above them, towards which they can strive. They can strive to imitate in reality, in real life, not just in acting. All right, so, what does this tell us about how they should act if they are to uh, act on or uh, act in storytelling or in theater. Okay, well, we have two methods. We have narration, we have imitation. We have stories, uh, we have ways of telling stories that do both, that can separate out narrative and the imitation. Uh, where we can have a narrator narrating events, and we can have an imitator imitating, sorry, an actor, right, imitating events, right, imitating what a character would do. And these are two separate ways of telling the story, but they can also be mixed as an epic poetry. Okay, so how should the person who is trying to be virtuous, what should they imitate and what should they narrate if they're trying to tell a story? Well, he does point out here that it is very important that virtuous people understand vice, that they understand vicious people. And they understand the sort of the, the temptation of doing the wrong thing and why people do the wrong thing, right? All of this is seen as very important for, for uh, virtuous people to understand uh, both themselves and what to avoid, but then also any uh, you know, social interactions they might have, or better yet, the city that they ideally will be governing. They have to understand vice, but they shouldn't imitate vice because that will, that will draw them towards it in a sense, right? It will get them a practice in doing the wrong thing, even if that practice isn't really imaginable. So, they do need to tell stories about vicious people. They need to have stories with villains. You can't simply have virtuous people doing virtuous things all the time in these stories. Uh, well, that is, that is a good thing. We also need villains. We also need someone to them, for them to fight against. We need stories about people doing the wrong thing so that people doing the right thing can be a contrast. Right? He talks about this a little bit earlier as far as the content of stories goes. Uh, I talked about this in another video, which, uh, which is also part of the Republic series, uh, and I'll also specifically link this. But he talks about this as well, right? He wants both elements in his stories for the Guardians, therefore also for our own stories and storytelling. However, he does not want his Guardians imitating villainy or vice. He wants them imitating things that are higher than them. So two options present themselves. Uh, one is that actors, professional actors, people whose, whose job is imitation, People who do not strive for virtue. This, is, this talks about Plato's idea of actors, by the way. 
that people who are not concerned with virtue and not concerned with the cultivation of wisdom and justice, that these people who are capable of imitating anything, or at least capable of in imitating anything in tragedy or imitating anything in comedy, and even if those are separate, perhaps they might be. We have tragic actors and comedic actors in our lives today, in our real world, present world, so fine, perhaps that's the case. But they should be the ones who are imitating these things for the Guardians to learn from by observation. Of course, this is also going to introduce strife into the city. If we have people who are capable of imitating anything, including vice, those people are going to be led to vice, those people are going to be a vicious influence upon the rest of the city, they should, according to Plato, be kept out. If they are around, they should come for the festivals, they should act, and then they should leave. They should never be part of the city. By analogy, by our allegory, by our allegorical interpretation, what this means is they should not be part of the self. The self, right, one's own self, should not be apt at imitating. The self should be uh, only prone to imitate or able to imitate what it ought to imitate, what it ought to strive for. Okay, so that's option one off the table. Uh, at least, uh, it, it, unless we're going to open the door for you know, other people to do the bad things for us, which seems a bit unscrupulous to say the least, right? And Plato points this out. The other option is to narrate some parts, but imitate others. And this is what he proposes. He proposes that for a guardian, one ought to narrate anything that is below oneself, anything that one ought not to strive to imitate, one ought to in the third person as at a sort of a distance, right? Whereas one ought to imitate, right? That which one ought to imitate in real life. So when a character is doing something virtuous, it ought to be acted, right? The, the, the guardian or the person in this sort of moral training, uh, this moral education should act out what is being done that is good. But if a character is doing something untoward, if, something, if a character is doing something that they ought not to, if a character is doing something that the guardian imitating that character ought not to, then and whether that means morally or even in terms of social standing, the guardian ought to narrate it, describe what's happening, rather than saying, uh, rather than describing one's actions in the first person and acting them out, one stands aside and one explains the scene, sets the scene and narrates it, tells. All right, so this is Plato's solution for how stories ought to be told by those who are seeking to draw moral lessons from them. Now, side note as well, that uh, maybe it's okay for actors to act out everything or nearly everything, because again, Plato seemed to think that actors, we can see why he thought this in, in his context, but Plato seemed to think that actors were of a, a particularly low moral standing. And so that damn near anything was acting at what they ought to aspire to, because almost anything is better than being an actor as far as Plato is concerned. Plato was a bit uh, biased against actors. So for them, maybe it's okay to imitate more things. Right? If one is not already a moral exemplar, then imitating uh, decent actions, maybe not heroic actions, but imitating decent actions is at least something. It's better than one is already, and so it's a good thing to imitate rather than to narrate. So, okay, there we go. Maybe that is the case, uh, but of course that shouldn't apply to people who are striving for moral perfection, which he ultimately wants to say we all should, so maybe don't, don't be an actor. <laughs> um, in any case, if one is to strive for moral perfection, Plato says in this section of the Republic, roughly this, um, that we ought to imitate what is above us, but because we also have to tell the rest of the story, we ought to narrate what is below us. So we should only imitate what is becoming of us, what is on our level or ideally better, both morally, socially, everything. Okay, so how does this apply to um, role-playing games, uh, gaming in general? Well, 
um, a lot of choice based, uh, sorry, a lot of uh, role playing video games are choice based. It gives the player the ability to choose between the good option and the not so good option, right? The moral option or the immoral option. The uh, to, to talk about um, the specific examples, uh, I wear examples, see the rest of my channel, see the live streaming parts. Um, Talking about choosing the light side versus dark side option, the paragon versus renegade option, color what you want, right? These different options allow the player to make a difficult choice. By the player making a difficult choice, they train in virtue if they make the right choice. Now, taking away this choice, because what if players use this leader or this? moral training, to train vice, to imitate the wrong things, right? To imitate vice rather than imitating virtue. Well, if you take away the choice, then putting oneself into the role doesn't have the same effect. One doesn't have this same sense of imitation, the same moral training, the same, uh, the same connection to the character one is imitating, such that it, uh, it serves to be a moral example, right? It serves so that it serves to be moral training. So you need the choice, just like you might in any kind of, you know, uh, any kind of free will dilemma. You need the choice in order to make the right one. But it is again important for moral training to make the right choice. So again, this is why I think that video games in this in this case provide a great tool for moral education. So things like playing through a game and, and thinking about and considering what choice one ought to make, and then considering further, why is that the right choice, right? If you can figure out why something is the right choice, then that will tell you that it's the right choice to make and that you should make it in the future, whether from education or in reality. And then further, it makes you more capable of imitating that in reality, in your real life, or at least in some similar circumstances. Okay. Now, video games are a simple case choices are relatively limited, and also our interaction with them is relatively limited. You play the game, you're in, you are already necessarily inserting yourself into the role of the character. However, what about more sophisticated or more abstract role-playing games, things like tabletop RPGs, uh, dragons, things like that. Um, I'm a big fan of these. Uh, I'm sometimes a player, usually a dungeon master or a game master, whatever you want to call it, right? Um, I am on occasion, sorry about that. <laughs> I'm on occasion both of these things, right? And so we encounter the question, how does one play a character? And I think we can take the same approach that Plato takes with respect to drama. We all play characters if we play tabletop RPGs. Usually we play a character as a dungeon master, you play lots of characters. Sometimes your player character or a uh, non-player character is good, is a paragon of moral, moral virtue, in which case I would think Plato would say, imitate. Play the role. Act out what you're doing. Act in the voice of your character, even if possible. Say what they would say as if you were them. Do what they would do if you're, especially you know, if you're around the table and not by a camera. That's a little, um, that's a little, that's a little bit harder. Um, but to act out, put yourself into that position of what is the character doing. However, sometimes we play unscrupulous characters, so morally flawed characters, evil characters, even whether that's a player character with, who's acting out a flaw, or whether that is a dungeon master who is playing, having to play the role of a villainous non-player character, a villainous enemy for the rest of the players. So what do we do? What do we do in that case? Well, we imitate what is worth imitating. If something is virtuous, if something is good, if something is praiseworthy, we imitate it, we take on that role. But if a character is doing something untoward, something immoral, we describe it, we narrate. We say that the character does such and such. The, the character does this immoral action. We explain how it works, and you can narrate the story in just as compelling a manner without acting out the character's immoral actions. Now, this is not a uh, this is not an automatic thing. This is not something that which sort of comes naturally, right? This switching between uh, imitation and narration, right? Uh, by default, we want to do one or we want to do the other. Jumping between the two is very, very difficult, uh, but it's, again, just like any other moral effort, is a skill to master 
that is then, I think, and I would propose, uh, and certainly I think Plato would agree, it is a skill that is going to continue to help. Right? It's going to help us develop further in our moral education. And so if we can master this skill, if, if you know, this kind of thing is something that we do, whether that's video games or whether that is uh, tabletop gaming or any kind of role-playing game or anything like this, or hell, acting, right? Making this kind of a distinction and acting in these different ways is, I think, a very good skill to master because it will then allow us to, uh, to help develop our other very, very important moral skills. All right, so that about wraps up this little section, at least, of the Republic. Uh, so, uh, with that, see you next time.